Well, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the latest in the Director Seminar Series for the NASA Astrobiology Institute. We're broadcasting to you this morning from the Exoplanet Division here at uh, NAI. And we are really, really pleased to have Jeff Marcy, uh, the discoverer of uh, most, of, or the leader of the team, uh, that discovered most of the planets that we know about around other stars with us this morning. Jeff has had a distinguished career, uh, which certainly began in California with degrees from UCLA and a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics from UC Santa Cruz, uh, then went back east to uh, the Carnegie Institution for a while, and then came back to California and has been a professor at San Francisco State University and now at UC Berkeley. Uh, he is going to be talking to us this morning about getting to the core of exoplanets from gas to ice giants, and I will turn it over immediately to Jeff. Uh, let's see. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is an exciting venue to, to be able to describe some of the recent results in extrasolar planets to, to a wide variety of people that have interests that are uh, more diverse, certainly, than the planets themselves offer. Um, let me just say that I'm going to try today to uh, go through some of the, the basics of extrasolar planets quickly, and then uh, rapidly move to recent results that I think bear on astrobiology. Let me start first by saying that um, I hardly do any of the work myself nowadays. Uh, I have spectacular team members, Paul Butler, Deborah Fisher, Steve Vogt, Jason Wright, John Johnson, our new postdocs, and uh, others, Katie Peake, Greg Henry, Greg Laughlin, all of whom are doing work both observationally and theoretically to uh, help us understand the properties of extrasolar planets. And of course, the real message is that what's happened in the last 12 years is that we've gone from just detecting planets, uh, stamp collecting, to characterizing properties of planets and ultimately learning about their formation and their evolution, both internally and dynamically. So um, without further ado, let me try to bring you up to speed in the field of extrasolar planets. Let's see if I can actuate the slides here. I can't quite yet. Is it going to flip? <laughs> try this out. Technical difficulties. Cool. Thank you so much. So I'll just remind you, and this is a little bit of a shock to show a slide like this right away, but to remind you that the vast majority of the now 250 known extrasolar planets are detected by the Doppler effect, watching the wobble of the star due to the planet orbiting and pulling on it. And you see in this slide, uh, overly complicated, uh, this, the, the sketch, the schematic of the whole technique. The star wobbles due to the uh, planet yanking on it gravitationally. You can use the equations of energy to determine the velocity of the planet as related to the uh, potential energy of the planet. And then knowing the velocity of the planet, you can use momentum conservation because, of course, the reflex velocity of the star will be reduced by the ratio of the masses, the planet to star mass. And so you expect from such a simple freshman level physics approach that stars will wobble with a speed of about 10 meters per second, Olympic running speed, if you will. Uh, and so that's the goal, is to be able to measure Doppler shifts uh, precisely enough to detect 10 meter per second wobbles due to Jupiter's, and then if you want to detect Neptune's and Earth's, you need velocity precision, Doppler precision, that's somewhat better. And we do this, of course, by measuring the Doppler effect with large uh, world-class telescopes and similarly world-class spectrometers. And at the back of every one of the large telescopes that we use, there is a spectacular spectrometer, as shown schematically here. And the light comes to a focus uh, as, after being spread out into its composite wavelengths at a digital camera, a CCD. And you can see what it looks like here. Here's a typical image that we get at the telescope itself. We use the Keck telescope in Hawaii, the Anglo-Australian telescope in Australia, and, and of course the Living Observatory <coughs> telescope here in Northern California. And that the, the challenge is actually daunting and has been for a decade. That is to measure velocities of stars 
to a few meters per second, which is only a part in 10 to the 9 of the speed of light. And that means you need to be able to measure displacements of the spectrum on your CCD detector to within a few nanometers. And you have to be able to come back a month later and determine whether the spectrum has displaced by a few nanometers. And then a year later, has it displaced by a few nanometers. And the way we do this is with a trick. Paul Butler and I invented this idea of putting iodine gas inside the telescope. We do it with a glass cell, pyrex cell, temperature controlled. The starlight comes in. When the starlight emerges from the uh, iodine cell, it has both the stellar spectral lines and the iodine spectral lines. And of course, the iodine lines do not participate in the Doppler effect. So that way, we can watch the Doppler shift of the stellar lines relative to the iodine lines. And uh, functionally, we do this with a model. We know what the iodine spectrum is. We know what the star spectrum is. And so that allows us to build a model of the observed spectrum, which, of course, is a composite, as shown with the dots here, a composite of the stellar and iodine spectra. And the model shown in the solid line fits very well. And the one free parameter, of course, in these models is the Doppler shift of the stellar portion of the spectrum. So we Doppler shift by uh, millions of a pixel, literally, to get down to a precision of a thousandth of a pixel, nanometer level precision. As I say, we're, we have to use the world's largest telescopes because to measure such tiny Doppler shifts, you need a lot of light. And so we're using um, many of the world's largest, including Magellan, uh, Subaru, uh, in addition to the three telescopes shown here. Just to remind you, um, this technique has, of course, been quite successful. There's a team in Geneva led by Michel Mayor, and he, of course, uh, and their group is doing excellent work as well. This is what we detect, both of us. We get velocity versus time. Here you see a decade of data. And if you look carefully, uh, you can see the points have coherence. The measured velocities over the course of time are, are coherent. You can see the periodicity by eye, in this case, about 2.2 years by connecting the dots, as you can do with a Keplerian model. And so the Keplerian model allows you to determine the period, but also the amplitude of the velocity variation, which tells you the mass of the planet. The bigger the mass of the planet, the more strongly that planet must be yanking on its host star, producing a greater reflex velocity. And so this is the basic technique we've been using now for, for about 10 years. In this case, the mass of the planet stems directly from Newtonian physics, it's about 70% bigger than Jupiter. As you all know, there's an ambiguity uh, because we don't know the tilt of the orbit plane very precisely. So we don't know the mass of the planet absolutely, but we get a lower limit to that mass. And the typical mass will be some 20 or 30% higher than the um, implied mass here. So that's the basic technique. And of course, in addition to the orbit and the mass of the planet, we also get the shape of the orbit from the shape of that velocity curve. And in this case, that sawtooth pattern that you saw implies, of course, an elliptical orbit. And that's shown here schematically for 16 Cygni b. You can see the elliptical orbit uh, relative to the inner four planets of our solar system. And so we actually derive a fair amount of information just from the Doppler techniques, rather amazing. No dot of light from the planet. We get the planet's semi-major axis, the size of the orbit, the uh, eccentricity of that orbital shape and the lower limit to the mass of the planet. And frankly, that's all we get. We really don't get much more information than that. But of course, from the size of the orbit, we can begin to infer the temperature of the planet from the distance between the star and the planet. Um, sheepishly, I have to show this uh, wonderful drawing from Lynette Cook's uh, uh, paintbrush. Uh, it's useful sometimes to have in your mind uh, an artist's rendering so that the, the physics that we know and what we don't know is sort of highlighted. And here is this rendering of 16 Cygni uh, B and actually the star A as well. The planet is in fact Hello. orbiting B. And um, because this planet is Jupiter-sized, as is the case for many, in fact the majority of our planets, we suspect that the composition is gaseous. It's so hard to imagine a planet the size of Jupiter being pure rock or rock and iron and nickel. So it's probably got plenty of volatiles, hydrogen and helium. And then Lynette Cook has added something for which we have no evidence at all, namely a moon. And of course, one exciting aspect is that 
uh, the giant planets in our own solar system all have moons, so it's quite possible that many, if not most, of the giant planets we're discovering have moons, some of them perhaps fairly large. In this case, the eccentric orbit would drag both the planet and the moon in so close that any water on the moon would sublimate, and I think there's no chance for um, water on the surface, at least, of this, of this sort of moon. Um, let me now run through the types of planets we've detected so far. And interestingly, one type that gets very little attention, surprisingly to me, is the type shown here. Here's one of our stars. We're surveying 2,000 uh, solar type stars, F, G, K, and M type stars. And you see the velocity over the course of time with a nice, clear uh, orbital motion, Keplerian motion. The period is nearly six years, and the minimum mass about three <coughs> Jupiter masses. And what's, I think, lovely about this example is, of course, the planet stands out like a sore thumb, but it's also a fairly long orbital period, something between the orbital periods of Mars and Jupiter. And this is representative of many of the planets that are beginning to emerge now in our survey, planets with uh, orbital distances from their star nearly as large as Jupiter is from our sun. Six years, Jupiter's orbital period, about 12 years. So we're beginning to find planets that remind us very much of our, our, the giant planets in our solar system, this one being more massive, and you see right away an eccentric orbit, the eccentricity of almost 0.5. That turns out to be the rule uh, rather than the exception, most of the planets we're finding, giant planets and smaller, as I'll discuss, are in orbits that are eccentric, not nearly circular as they are in our solar system. Here's another lovely example of, of these planets that get too little attention, planets with large orbital periods reminding us of Jupiter. This is velocity versus time, again, 10 years. You see a nice curve only in the last few months did we see it close. We weren't sure if the velocities would just keep going down, but instead, uh, they've turned up, and that's very exciting to us because now uh, you see how exciting it was to us with all the data points we have there. Um, we're, we're, we now know that the orbital period is about nine years, almost that of Jupiter's, and the mass, the minimum mass, turns out to be 1.0 Jupiter masses. So this is yet another sign that other stars, like the Sun, uh, quite often have planets that remind us closely of the giant planets in our own solar system. Jupiter's and Saturn's are not at all rare. Some five or so percent, I, I estimate by some modest extrapolation, five or 10 percent of all of the sun-like stars have planets something like this one, Jupiter-sized, Jupiter-like orbit. In this case, the eccentricity is modest, but we need more data points uh, to be sure. Of course, we're finding a lot of planets that are smaller. And here's two representative sub-Saturns uh, velocity versus orbital phase. We quite easily pick out planets of 30 Earth masses or so in these two examples, albeit with very short orbital periods, but you can see how easily planets of a, a few tens of Earth masses stand out. Um, and these are quite old data now where our velocity precision is even better now than it was when we uh, took most of these data points. So planets of, of sub-Saturn mass stand out. We're also finding a lot of multiple planet systems. There are now 22 well-established, and I can tell you there's three more that are yet to be uh, announced, multiple planet systems. And here's one that's quite obvious to your eye, velocity versus time. Again, you're seeing eight years or so. And you can see there's one periodicity superimposed on another periodicity. So there's no question there are at least two planets in this system, and you can decompose this velocity variation into each of the two planets. In this case, the planets don't interact gravitationally, so you can simply use a model that consists of two planets, each one orbiting their host star as if they were orbiting by themselves. And so it's the sum of the effects of both of these two planets that yield the wobble of the star. So this is a remarkable, I think, uh, emerging new subfield in extrasolar planets, the study of the origin and the subsequent dynamics of multiple planet systems. And in particular, the dynamics are highlighted by some interesting systems. This is HD 128311, a sun-like star, velocity versus time. This very odd, almost ugly looking velocity variation, but it can be de decomposed, as in the previous case, into two simple uh, Keplerian <coughs> orbits with orbital periods that are in the ratio of uh, two to one. 
this 458 days, 918 days, and indeed n-body simulations show that this system is in a two-to-one dynamical mean motion resonance. That is, the planets are not just, they don't just happen to have orbital period ratios of, of two to one, but in fact they dynamically, gravitationally shepherd each other, maintaining that two to one ratio of their orbital periods, uh, and presumably will do so essentially forever. So one question that emerges from any system like this, is it just a fluke that the planets formed in these two to one period ratios, or is there some dynamical uh, evolution that trapped them into these uh, resonances, and I think it's the latter. We have now three or four, actually four I can think of, mean motion resonances. That's too many to just be a coincidence. So I think what is now quite a dramatic result <coughs> stemming from these mean motion resonances is the clear evidence that planets form wherever they happen to, and then they migrate in their protoplanetary disks and may occasionally capture each other into these mean motion resonance. These serve as uh, clear evidence of migration of the planets within the early few tens of millions of years of the system. Here's um, a very recent case. We just uh, announced this a couple, three weeks ago. 55 Cancri, G8 star, uh, same mass as the sun, a little bit less, uh, same chemical composition as the sun, about the same age as the sun. Here's velocity versus time. Remarkably, and I mean almost embarrassed to say this, the first data points were taken in late 1988. 1988, and since then, this is Paul Butler and I starting way back in the dark ages, and now you see 18 years of data points. Your eye picks out a long period periodicity, you see all of this scatter, and immediately a Fourier power spectrum shows, yes, uh, there's a 14 year period and this 14 day period. Those are the two planets that emerged relatively quickly in the first few years. If you then build a model that has those two planets, subtract that from the observed data points, and look at what's left over, the velocity residuals, you can then take a power spectrum of them. And here's what you see, a very tall delta function at 44 days. That might ring a bell because 44.3 is exactly a factor of three more than 14.6. So there's a suggestion of a three to one mean motion resonance. If you then include that planet into your model for uh, with all three planets, look at the residuals, take a power spectrum again, now you see a 2.8 day planet emerge. And our collaborators at Texas, Barbara MacArthur and Bill Cochran, did a great job of uh, extracting this from te Texas data. Now you have a fourth planet, build a model with four planets, subtract the effects of all of them, and what's left now is yet one last planet that we've found. This was the one we announced a few weeks ago, 260 days. There's really no way around this. You might scratch your head as we have for years. Can you somehow argue that there isn't a fifth planet? And, and you just can't. There's no way around it. Your residuals are going to have this periodicity. It shows up both at Keck and at Lick independently. So this is the first five planet system uh, and it's got some structural similarities to our own solar system. Here's the fifth planet, by the way. Yeah, it looks ugly, but then you should expect that getting that last planet out of the data, extracting it from the other four planets, isn't going to be easy. And it's going to be the most difficult of the five planets to detect. But there's no question about the periodicity just by eye, never mind Fourier analysis. And the system has similarities architecturally. Here's 55 Cancri, four inner planets all having lower mass than the outer planet of four Jupiter masses, and of course our solar system with four terrestrial planets and a Jupiter mass and even a Saturn mass out farther away. So it's remarkable that both have this gap. Um, of course, we know what's in the gap in our solar system. We don't know what's in the gap of 55 Cancri. We can put limits on what planets would, if they were there, we would have detected, and it's about 20 Earth masses. So there's something, if there's anything in this gap in 55 Cancri, it's less than a few tens of Earth masses. And of course, I think it's very exciting to think about how we might detect whatever's in there, debris, maybe with infrared uh, methods, or um, planets uh, by some other method. Um, and by the way, the habitable zone is shown here in the green. So the, the fourth planet out that we just announced is at the inner uh, region of the habitable zone, and it leaves a little bit of possibility of a, of a sixth planet that would be in the outskirts 
of the habitable zone. Here it is again. One of the fun things of many things you can do with this system besides the dynamics, I can only have time to talk about one of them that I enjoy. You can imagine taking a, a hammer and smashing all of the planets in the 55 Cancri system, smearing out the material out of which they formed into a disk, presumably the disk that uh, the planets formed from. And by doing that, you can learn something about the density distribution of the protoplanetary disk out of which the planets form, and of course, the surface mass density. Uh, and you find that the surface mass density is several times higher than the minimum mass solar nebula, and the total mass of the disk is almost a tenth of a solar mass. So this is a disk that presumably was healthier, if you will, a little richer than the um, uh, minimum mass solar nebula. Uh, I mentioned we have 22 secure multi-planet systems. Here's a, a schematic of them. The quality of this graph isn't very high, but the stars shown on the left. And the main point of this plot is to just show we're finding many, many plan planetary systems with two, three, four, and now five planets. Clearly, our detectability is unable to find the terrestrial planets, so many of these probably have even more planets. Um, but what's lovely about these is that it's the interactions of the planets and their current mean motion resonances, other types of resonances, that give us clues, especially the theorists, clues about how the planets must have formed and migrated to get into the configurations they're in. So I think this is a very rich area um, from the observational side to pursue these and then uh, pursue all of the uh, theoretical implications. The distribution of masses of extrasolar planets is shown here. Um, probably all of you know this result, but here's the most recent one with 215. The best quality planets are shown here. The rise toward lower and lower masses um, with a sort of a nearly power law dependence. And what's exciting, of course, is the notion that even though these are, this is a Jupiter scale here from 0 to 15 Jupiter masses, clearly below a Saturn mass, the mass distribution is still rising. And there's every reason to think that nature makes more Neptunes than Saturn's, and as I would suggest in a few moments, I imagine nature makes even more rocky planets than the Neptunes and gas giants. So that's an exciting uh, result at this stage. Um, we also have the eccentricities, which is telling us something a little frightening from the astrobiology standpoint. Orbital eccentricity versus semi-major axis. Uh, at 1 AU, here's the Earth for reference, 1 AU, very low eccentricity, but you see the vast majority of the extrasolar planets have eccentricities much above the circular orbits of our solar system. And the, I don't, I, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the many brilliant models that have been put forth to explain uh, the wide variety of orbital eccentricities. Um, nobody knows why they're in these eccentric orbits, but the, the rough sketch is when planets form, either when they're still in their sort of embryonic stage or later on when they're mature, they gravitationally interact with each other, perhaps also interacting with the disk out of which they form. And that bumper car era, the scattering of planets against each other, tends to throw them out of the original circular orbits in which they formed um, by, by various means, and that leads to distributions like this. There's some wonderful models that reproduce now, this diagram, the distribution of eccentricities. Of course, you notice the closest in planets are mostly have very circular orbits due to tidal circularization, tidal effects with the host star. <clears throat> so this is an exciting result, and I think what's worthy of some note from an astrobiology standpoint is this last corner of domain. In here, the orbital uh, semi-major axes are 2.5 AUs and beyond, Notice the scatter in eccentricities. These are giant planets akin to our own Jupiter at 5 AUs, 5.2 <coughs> AUs. And there's no evidence that these planets have any more circular orbits than do all the other planets. So the suggestion is that giant planets, even out at 5 AUs, tend to have eccentricities uh, that span a wide range and are much greater than the eccentricities of the, of the planets in our own solar system. It would be lovely, of course, to get a few more planets out here at 5 to 10 AUs and see if any of them tend more toward uh, circular orbits statistically. Um, the semi-major axis distribution of the planets is shown here. I think the one take-home message from this, you're seeing semi-major axis and the number of them. The take-home message, and people somehow haven't 
they, this hasn't made the, the newspapers or, or the, the consciousness of even scientists in, in large part that most of the extrasolar planets known orbit beyond 1 AU. Somehow people think that many or most of the extrasolar planets are very close in. The hot Jupiters are making the headlines. But in fact, the majority of known extrasolar planets orbit farther out than, than 1 AU. And, and there's certainly a, a selection effect against finding these planets out at 5 and 10 AUs because their orbital periods are so long that we haven't had a chance to detect them. Also, the wobble of the star is lower. So between the poor detectability and this large hump that you're seeing here, it almost looks, and I wonder if this is beginning to become true, that there's sort of a discontinuity here, maybe associated with the ice line that is often talked about, such that giant planets form uh, quite efficiently beyond an AU, but not so efficiently inward. Or maybe there's a migration issue, that the planets migrate inward and uh, slip in very quickly, leaving a paucity of giant planets in here. So this is an exciting new area where we're beginning to see the giant planets emerge and uh, determine what their prevalence is. And again, I, with some extrapolation, you can say that some 13% of all stars that we are surveying, 2,000 nearby stars, some 13% of them seem to have giant planets, kin of our own giant planets in our solar system. By the way, some 85 or 7% of the stars don't have giant planets, uh, at least Jupiter-sized. I think this is the most important plot of my whole talk. Um, it comes from work by Deborah Fisher and Jeff Valenti, uh, and it's now well known, but it's worth reiterating this effect is not going away, and its interpretation is being clarified. The probability that a planet, sorry, the probability that a star has a planet is directly related to the uh, metallicity of the abundance of the heavy elements within the stars, the host stars, and we characterize that in, astron in astrophysics with the iron to hydrogen ratio. This is a log scale. The sun is 0, 0.00, but you see that stars that have more heavy elements have a higher probability of harboring planets. Very dramatic effect, incontrovertible, and the most likely interpretation is the simplest one, actually, and the one you would have thought of, namely protoplanetary disks that are rich in heavy elements, oxygen, silicon, iron, nickel, have a lot more dust per unit mass than they otherwise would have, and that extra dust mass allows planet growth to be enhanced. Uh, the rate is enhanced. They grow to gas giants more quickly before the gas is dissipated away. And models now confirm that this uh, trend can be reproduced with theory. And I list some of the authors of the models, Ada and Lynn and Cornett and Ed Thomas and others. So there's very exciting result here that suggests, and I want to mention what I think is a, an extrapolation of the interpretation. Heavy elements leads to planets, and most specifically leads to coagulation of dust, giving you the rocky cores that are the obviously the necessities of both giant planets, but obviously also the terrestrial planets. This plot alone suggests to me that dust growth leads to terrestrial planets. They must be numerous, even though we haven't detected any Earth-like, Earth-sized planets yet. This conclusion about rocky cores being the building blocks for planets in general is shown by two spectacular cases. HD 149026, velocity versus orbital phase. You see the Keplerian motion. It's only a 2.9 day orbital period, Deborah Fisher and, and uh, Bunai Sato, Greg Laughlin discovered this. It was then quickly found that the planet transits the star, dimming the star repeatedly over and over again, work by Greg Henry. That dimming tells you the radius of the planet, the bigger the planet, the more light is blocked. And so schematically, uh, you can see the situation here, planet transiting, blocking the starlight, giving us its radius, and then hence the density of the planet. And what's amazing about this planet is that its density is even higher than that of Saturn's, even though its mass is about the same as Saturn's. How can you make a planet that has about the same mass as Saturn, but a much higher density? It must be that there's more heavy elements within the planet, either in a core or distributed throughout. And in any case, it means that Saturn's rocky core of 20 Earth masses or so that's known, um, must be an e there must be an even larger rocky core inside this planet of HD 149026. And you see Peter Bodenheimer's model here, the planet 149026b with this enhanced core required to explain the radius um, that we see. 
A second example of this uh, prevalence of rocky cores is shown in this one, Gliese 436. This is an M dwarf, a third of a solar mass. You see our Keck velocities here again. Um, in, incontrovertibly, a uh, planet, 22.6 Earth masses, 2.6 day, very close in planet. Luckily, here again, it transited. Um, and I'll show you in the next slide that the eccentricity is interesting too. Here's the, the beautiful, I think spectacular work by Gion uh, et al. 2007 showing the dimming of the star. We've seen now hundreds of these transits of the planet across the surface of the star uh, giving us the radius. And the new estimate of the radius, uh, you may, if you've been following this, here's a new radius that's a little bigger than the original radius that uh, Gion got, 4.3 Earth radii, coupled with the mass from the Doppler effect, gives us the density. And the density is remarkable, 1.6 grams per cubic centimeter. That again is much higher than Saturn's density um, and again suggests a large rocky core. Here is the model uh, that, um, in fact, Jonathan Fortney and Mark Marley and others put together here at NASA Ames. And um, it's, th this story is not over that you can see from the model that they put forth a rocky core, something like the rocky uh, interior of Neptune, a very thick water envelope, and then probably, uh, and indeed likely, a fairly thick hydrogen helium shell. Now, the problem is that the relative amounts of rock, water, and gas can't really be unambiguously determined. The degeneracy, of course, is due to the fact that all three components have a very different density, and therefore you can mix together various amounts of two out of the three and reproduce the observed density. It's about 1.55 grams per cc. So we can't really say for sure that this planet definitely has a rocky core and this much water or this much hydrogen and helium. It must have admixtures that give you this final density, probably <coughs> If you fold in our knowledge of planet formation, this density, uh, what we know about the location of the planet and how it got there, probably this model, I would say, is about right. If I had to bet, if someone forced you to bet, you'd bet, yeah, there's a big rocky core, water in, uh, envelope, and then a hydrogen helium shell. But Jack, can I interrupt? interrupt? Sure. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. But you keep saying rocky. Right. I presume you're including metal? Absolutely. And are you talking about something Just like to be the Absolutely. And I was going to say, like the Earth, or like terrestrial planets, probably an iron-nickel central part of the core, and then a silicate outer portion, all of which makes up the core. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so this is, what's exciting here, in part, is the ambiguity. Clearly, what we need now are planets that transit like Gliese 436, but which are smaller, maybe 10 Earth masses or 5 Earth masses, for which we can play the same game, get the density, and it would be just great if we could get a population of observed planets of a few Earth masses for which we get their densities and determine whether they are indeed rocky, in which case their densities, of course, would be that of roughly the Earth or Venus, 5, 5.5 grams per cc. So that's an exciting future uh, goal. Gliese 876, I think, remains, in my view, the most spectacular of the discoveries so far. Here's the data from Rivera and Lissauer et al. You see velocity versus time for over a decade. Best fit with a three-planet model. What's amazing is the outer two Jupiters are in a two-to-one mean motion resonance. The fit is very good only if you add the third planet, and that's shown here. It's an inner uh, planet with a period of two days and you see the minimum mass is only 5.9 Earth masses. I will tell you somewhat cryptically that in my opinion, this is still the best case of a very low mass planet um, that exists out there. And when you throw in the, our knowledge of the tilt of the orbital plane that we get from the outer two planets and their dynamics, the mass comes out to be seven and a half Earth masses. So this is again a suggestion that nature does indeed make planets of lower and lower mass in greater and greater numbers. Uh, this being one of the few stars for which we could have detected uh, a few Earth mass planet, and we did. So it's, it's quite exciting. Of course, this one is too hot with a normal period of two days to have liquid water uh, anywhere on its surface. Oh, and I should add, by going back a slide, we really don't know the composition of this planet. It doesn't transit. We don't have its density. 
So whether it's rocky or has a large complement of, of water ice like Neptune, we don't know. If I had to bet, and I'm stretching here, my guess is planets of five to 10 Earth masses, suggestion is they are more akin to Neptune than our Earth. I bet planets of that size attract ices and have a big complement of water. Um, quickly, here's an exciting uh, new kind of planet that I'm not sure all of you are aware of. It's, it's so much fun. Uh, there's a, an astronomer who's a postdoc at Harvard, um, Gaspar Bakos, who's finding transiting planets in large numbers. Here you see the, the dimming of the star uh, due to the planet crossing in front. And the analysis by Bakos and Josh Wynn is shown in the next few slides. Here are our velocities taken at Keck for the wobble of the star. Yes, the star wobbles. It's an eccentric orbit of 0.5. That's fine that the planet transits its star. But what's interesting is that here the Keplerian behavior is kind of off somehow. And if you zoom in on that little domain, you see that the velocities due to the Keplerian are disturbed in this sort of S shape. And the reason it's disturbed is that as the planet crosses the star, it first blocks the approaching edge or limb of the star, and then the planet blocks the receding edge of the star. And so there's a net Doppler shift due to the fact that the approaching light is blocked and then the receding light is blocked. So you're actually getting a sense of the direction of motion of the planet relative to the spin of the star. And if you do the, the math, so to speak, you can easily confirm that these data with the velocity going high and that redshift and then low tells you that the angular momentum of the orbit of the planet is in the same direction vectorally as the spin angular momentum of the star, just as it is in our own solar system. And there are about five other cases that Josh Wynn has been following that show exactly the same thing. So perhaps you would have predicted this, but it turns out all of the planets for which we've done this kind of analysis show that the orbits and the spin of the star are in the same direction. Um, here is a blow up of Josh Wynn's beautiful modeling showing the, uh, the velocity wobble due to this, this, uh, this effect. It's quite exciting. And of course, we'd love to find a case that didn't obey this. If you could find a case where the star was spinning one way and the planet going the other way, that would raise some eyebrows. Uh, so it's quite an exciting new field where we're, we're learning something about the dynamics of migration. Now, I'd like to spend the last six or seven minutes of my talk in um, a little bit of a frightening area. So I want to caution you ahead of time that what I'm about to say, for the most part, I don't know what I'm talking about. And uh, so you can take what I say with a grain of salt. But I wanted, I looked back at the past um, director's seminar series talks uh, that Carl Pilcher and his team have put on the web. And I was surprised that no one that I could see reached out and speculated about intelligent life, uh, advanced life in the galaxy. So I couldn't help but give my two cents worth albeit uninformed. And of course, the calculation that Frank Drake would do right away is to say, well, our galaxy has 200 billion stars. We now have detected 10% uh, of them having planets. Of course, we can only find the Jupiters, Neptunes, and Saturns. But the suggestion would be that there are something like 20 billion planetary systems that have these giant planets alone, never mind all of the systems that may have smaller planets that we can't yet detect of Earth size. But there's every suggestion for planet formation theory that to the extent that Jupiters and Saturns are common, the smaller rocky planets will be even more common. And the, the models suggest this clearly. So there are at least some 20 billion planetary systems within our um, Milky Way. And then, of course, those of you who saw Norm Pace's talk, I was enjoying watching it on the web of the director's seminar series. Um, Norm started his talk, I saw, with this quote. So I wanted to remind you of what Norm said. Terrestrial life has penetrated all permissible thermodynamic and physical niches offered by the planet Earth. All of us know that. Consequently, it is likely that terrestrial life offers models for life in almost any habitable niche in the universe. Of course, that's sort of an underlying um, tenet of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, but it's remarkable that even from the molecular biology standpoint, from the tree of life standpoint, uh, those of you who are studying this come to this sort of a conclusion stemming from the extremophiles 
that show us that in you know environments that seem hideous, life thrives anyway. And that, of course, offers us a suggestion in the extrasolar planet business. Um, and now here's where the speculation really goes wild. Now if you go back to the 20 billion planetary systems, many of them, of course, are going to be older than the Earth, Frank Drake and Carl Sagan and so many other people ask, well, what fraction of them might spawn complex multicellular life for which Darwinian evolution would have a chance of proceeding toward uh, technology? And of course, we don't know. I mean, I think the most remarkable portion of ignorance about biology, in my mind, is we can't tell, the evolutionary biologists cannot tell us what fraction of the time single-celled life on a nice, docile, tranquil, uh, habitable planet will lead to intelligent life. So, as we all know, in Frank Drake's world, you pick a number, uh, one in a million can be multiplied by 20 billion, and you find out, as the science fiction writers have known forever, that uh, there should be thousands of advanced civilizations. This is the standard calculation we teach in freshman uh, uh, astronomy classes, and it still holds true, except I think what doesn't get discussed adequately is that if there are thousands of advanced civilizations in our Milky Way galaxy, the Fermi paradox is still alive and well. It is still a mystery, whether or not you want to admit it, that with all of the ways we could have detected advanced life that could have sent robotic spacecraft to the moon, set up cameras, uh, same with Mars, they could have set up golf courses here on the Earth and, and vacation resorts for billions of years, the Earth was a Shangri-La. They didn't do that. Uh, there are footprints, of course, on the moon, but they're ours. So it's remarkable that there's simply no evidence that in the millions and billions of years that advanced species could have sent even machines here, there's no evidence of it. And of course, a wide variety of other non-detections of advanced life, no gamma ray uh, emission from the matter-antimatter engines of the Klingons, uh, you know, and uh, no robotic probes orbiting our solar system that we've detected. SETI still struggling to get its first uh, detection. So there is a possibility that the evolutionary biologists uh, have their work cut out for them to tell us uh, why it might be that primitive life should be common, as Norm Pace's talk indicated, but advanced life, and indeed technological life, at this stage could be rare. It could be that it's one in a billion, not one in a million. So this, this Fermi paradox is certainly, in my view, um, something to be considered. Uh, and it's a part of what makes NASA astrobiology a real science. We don't know the answer. It's not that we're trying to look for advanced life and understand it. It might be that advanced life isn't as common as we thought. The answer is no, and I think that's beautiful. That's what science should be all about, not necessarily knowing the answer. Um, there are, of course, three missions designed uh, right now uh, by NASA to detect Earth-like planets. Kepler is the most promising launch due in, in a year and a half. Of course, I think everybody knows Kepler will detect Earth-like planets by the Earth's crossing in front of the star, dimming the star. Um, it's very exciting. Over 100,000 stars will be monitored in Cygnus and Lyra, hoping to detect the Earth's, but more importantly, detect the occurrence rate of Earth's. What fraction of sun-like stars have rocky planets like the Earth, and what's their distribution of orbital parameters? Two other missions, SIM and the Terrestrial Planet Finder, are also extremely promising. SIM, frankly, more than ever, is promising. The technology is completely ready to go. The Terrestrial Planet Finder is less ready to go architecturally, but both have very valuable niches, especially TPF, to get spectra of Earths. And as you know, budget constraints have delayed these two missions. They will happen, uh, lest we all be depressed, and I am. But there's no doubt that at some point in the next few decades, both of these missions have to happen. You must get masses of, of Earth-like planets, and you must get their spectra to understand Earth-like planets. So uh, while these missions are, are, are struggling, uh, NASA's on the right track. In the meantime, we're going to try to detect Earth-like planets from the ground. Uh, we're building a new telescope at Lick Observatory that you see here. The dome is in. The telescope is finished. Here's the dome with San Jose in the background, and there's a line of sight to NASA Ames. It's right about there. So actually, you can see the hangar uh, from Lick Observatory, and we expect to put in a, a microwave link very soon. And what's exciting about this new telescope is we'll use it every single night to detect Earth-like planets. Uh, by detecting the Doppler shift every night, you can trace out 
very small amplitude variations. Here's a, a synthesis of a 10 Earth mass planet orbiting in a 50 day orbital period. And you can see, of course, by eye, the wobble of the star, velocity versus time, due to a mere 10 Earth mass planet. They stand out like a sore thumb, primarily because you have such good sampling, nightly sampling, which clearly isn't required. The Fourier analysis shows the peak clearly. What about smaller mass planets? Two Earth masses. Again, they show up, here's velocity versus time simulated with our one and a half, uh, one, uh, one meter per second errors. You can't see the velocity periodicity here, but the Fourier analysis shows the peak very clearly there. So we will have no trouble detecting planets of a few Earth masses in orbital periods of uh, months that reside in the habitable zone. The temperature, by the way, the equilibrium temperature of this planet without greenhouse effect is some 80 C. So there will be Earth mass planets around sunlight stars, a few Earth masses that will stand out easily. Even one Earth mass shows up. You might need two summers of this telescope rather than just one summer. Here's about one summer's worth of data. So it's pretty exciting that from the ground even, along with Kepler, we should be able to get a handle on the occurrence rate of rocky planets. Um, and then finally, what we really all should remember is that if you find an Earth-like planet, the real uh, excitement will begin when you turn your radio telescopes toward them and try to pick up any signals. And of course, at the SETI Institute with Berkeley, uh, the Paul Allen Telescope Array is being built uh, north of Mount Lassen with hundreds of dishes the goal would be, of course, once you find an Earth-like planet, you stare at that darn thing for weeks, maybe months, because if you know there's an Earth-like planet there, you, you put your eggs in that basket uh, and try to pick up any weak signals from civilizations that, uh, that are actually transmitting. So I think that's the excitement. Um, the bottom line, really, from, from the uh, microbiologists among you, the Norm Pace uh, type perspective, is that the ingredients for life are out there, the petri dishes are there, the, the stuff of life is out there, the energy and the water is abundant in the universe in a variety of different ways. So I don't think any of us, at least in my view, doubt that replicating molecules of some sort will begin uh, forming, competing, and evolving. The real question now is whether or not there's advanced life uh, anywhere in the, uh, in the galaxy. And I think I'll just summarize by saying the, the real take home message of my talk, I think, is that the fact that planet occurrence correlates with metallicity of the star, the fact that we see the rocky cores in the planets, the two cases I showed, tells you that dust accumulation into rocky bodies is a common process. Rocky planets must be common. Even though we haven't detected any pure rocky planets yet, it would be a real stretch to suggest that rocky planets are rare. In contrast, I would say rocky planets of Earth size are probably even more common than the Jupiters and the Saturns. There are billions of Earth-sized planets probably within our Milky Way galaxy. And then from the kind of perspective that Norm uh, presented, primitive life probably is common. And the real question, I think, for all of us is whether or not evolutionary biology can tell us something about the uh, occurrence of the uh, of intelligence and technology so i'll stop there thank you well we now have opportunities uh, for people here in the room in ames and people around the net to ask jeff questions so let me first ask if there's a question here at ames and would anybody around the net please raise your hand on webex and we'll call on you and we'll start with a question from dave Demery. yeah my question uh, is that this relationship between the metallicity of the star which you can see yeah. and of course the composition of the disk and i guess there's two aspects of it do you think we could look at metallicities of the stars to get a sense of what the distribution of compositions would be for the disk, you know, with outcomes for how much volatiles you might get on rocky planets and so forth? And then the other aspect of that question is the strongly migrated systems that you see where Jupiter's in close, could they be systems where a lot of stuff was dumped into the star and could you see a correlation between the metallicity right. of the star and how strongly migrated the system was? Yeah, let me, you asked a number of questions. Let me address the last one first. There was a controversy uh, beginning six, seven years ago uh, as to whether or not the correlation between the, the occurrence of planets and the metallicity of the host stars was sort of nature or nurture. Is it that the stars are polluted 
by the planets themselves that, that dump inward. And there's very strong evidence now that it's not the pollution. And the, the, the evidence in brief is that some stars have very thin convective envelopes, so thin that any metals dumped onto the star would have been trapped in that convection zone, unable to diffuse inward. We should see very dramatically enhanced metallicities of those stars, and we don't. So it's not pollution primarily. There might be some aspect to it. It's, but it's, it's a primordial effect, where, which is what you might have guessed at first glance. More metals means more dust, and as all the planet formation models have it, the enhanced dust gives you more planet formation. Um, with regard to your other question, we certainly know that um, stars in the disk of our galaxy have a range of um, metal abundances, silicon, oxygen, iron, nickel, the, about a factor of two or three uh, above that of the sun and below that of the sun. And almost certainly the protoplanetary disks shared uh, that range, that distribution of metallicities. And of course, water is very abundant in the protoplanetary disks as a common molecule that forms from hydrogen and oxygen. So my strong suspicion is that planets form with rocky cores quite commonly get a good complement of volatiles, both the ices, methane and water ices, and then hydrogen and helium. I think actually it, there's still a bit of a touchy question as to how you form a pure rocky planet without it gobbling up some more of the volatiles. Why does the Earth have as little water as it has? I'm not sure anyone knows the answer to that. Um, uh, we have a question from University of Washington. OK, let's go to University of Washington. We'll come back here to Ames. Hi, Jeff. Tom Quinn. <clears throat> uh, could you re remind me uh, what the eccentricity distribution of the planets in 55 Cancri are? And would you com uh, uh, con compare that with that of the solar system? Yeah, thank you. Um, they're all circular. Um, they're circular within errors. Um, the innermost planet has an eccentricity of, that's the highest. It, that's, been, that's the 10 Earth mass one, right in close. It seems to be an eccentricity of about 0.15. The others are all less than 0.1. And in fact, um, we didn't know that until well, a few weeks, well, until we published this paper. Uh, with only a model of four planets, you, you are required to pump up their eccentricities to explain the data. But now that the fifth planet is, is clearly there, all of their eccentricities naturally dropped, just you know, by best, the best fit, to uh, sub a tenth uh, eccentricity. So it's a, it's a system, as shown in the diagram, with nearly circular orbits. A okay, question from Jeff Pesci here. Jeff, uh, has any, I'm sure you have. Uh, what do you get when you try to correlate the eccentricity of the planets with the metallicity? Yeah, the, the question is, how about the correlation between eccentricity and metallicity? There is a little correlation. It hasn't gotten much air time. Um, the sense is planets with large orbital eccentricities and large mass above a Jupiter mass Tend to come, tend to orbit stars of slightly lower than average metallicity, as if there's a formation mechanism for the massive eccentric planets that somehow isn't quite the same as the formation mechanism of all the rest of the planets. Maybe, for example, gravitational instabilities plays more of a role for planets of five or ten Jupiter masses uh, than it does for planets less than a Jupiter mass. It's a, it's a slight tendency, but we've done Kolmogorov Smirnoff tests, and indeed, the massive eccentric planets orbit low metallicity stars systematically. Question in the back here. Yeah. Uh, are you uh, using the uh, revisionist uh, abundances of the sun when you say solar, or using the more traditional abundances? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, as you say, the abundances in the sun are being revised as we speak, but primarily the diagnostic here is iron. And the abundance of iron in the sun, to my knowledge, hasn't been adjusted much recently. No, iron. It's right. It's mainly uh, oxygen. Yes. And silicon neon. Right. And, and we don't know as much about the abundances of those elements. They're harder to measure. And you're right, there's, there's a state of flux about their normalization. Iron we use as a proxy, and frankly, a rather poor proxy, of the abundances of the other heavy elements. But so with regard to the correlations I've mentioned, iron is really what I meant when I say metallicity. 
David Morrison. I'd like to try to pin you down a little bit on the super Earths, up to say 10 Earth masses. Yeah. Very interesting for Kepler because that's one of the areas we'll yeah. support. Very interesting for astrobiology. Yeah. Sounds like you're getting the first data, but is there actually enough data to tell if there is going to be a common class of planets between terrestrial and giant? Yeah. The the, the super Earths quite common. I think of the super Earths as planets between one Earth mass and 14 Earth masses, where Uranus is there being a gap in our own solar system in the mass distribution. And um, we've we and the Swiss team now have some 10 of these. I think one or two of them might be suspect, but most of them are not. Um, and so there's clearly a class of planets between one and 14 Earth masses probably rocky cores and some amount of, of volatiles, especially the ices. Um, so I think there's no doubt that there is that intermediate class of planets that simply is not represented in our solar system. On the other hand, you might think of them as mini Neptunes, which makes them continuous. There's a question from Goddard. Yeah, hi, Jeff. It's Mike Muma. Hi, Mike. Uh, Jeff, uh, hi. Uh, Jeff, can you uh, tell us the current status of uh, long-term dynamical modeling for the planetary evolution and systems that you've been uh, studying? For example, 55 Cant Cree. Is anybody working on that? No. Nope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's so hot off the press. It's out there now. Of course, the, we put the preprint uh, out three weeks ago. And I have very little doubt that probably in, in your room and some of the other rooms here and maybe this room, there are people who can do the analysis either analytically or numerically and are, I hope are busy doing so. Um, there are people I know like Jack Lissauer, uh, Eric Ford, um, Manhoi Lee, others who, you know, chomping at the bit to analyze these systems and I strongly suspect that they are doing so. But I'm actually not aware right now of anyone that's communicated with me that they've made progress. In particular, the three to one mean motion resonance uh, is still up in the air. Is it really a resonance or has it, is it not really a, 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 a shepherding system? And is the whole system stable for all possible eccentricities that, you know, within our air bars or can you limit the, the uh, orbital parameters by demanding dynamical stability? Those questions are still open. Well, the direction of my question was a little broader. Uh, it was in the more in the context of uh, does uh, would you expect highly eccentric systems to lead to uh, shorter lifetimes for potential life-bearing planets and therefore affect in a downward sense the possibility of systems that might e indeed harbor life or where life might have arisen and prospered? Uh, I'm not. You've asked a, a number of interesting issues. I, I think my impression from the dynamicists is that. The dynamical evolution that leads eventually to ejection of planets, uh, to large eccentricities of planets, that happens relatively early on, typically within the first tens or hundreds of years. Uh, Tom Quinn could perhaps talk about this or Jack Lissauer. Um, and it's certainly the case that when you have a large planet of Jupiter or Saturn size in an eccentric orbit, it renders any Earth-like planets vulnerable to uh, being ejected by that larger planet. So there's no doubt at this stage that planetary systems that have even one planet in an eccentric orbit render the whole system, I think, less likely to harbor a habitable planet. Jeff, I'll uh, add a question. Uh, do you think that there is an upper limit to the mass of a bare rocky planet, either because of limits opposed by the accretion itself or because when you get above a certain size, you start accreting ices or hydrogen and helium on top of it? Yeah, well, I don't know the answer to this, and you almost answered the question in your posing of it. Uh, it's certainly probably the case that if you take a typical protoplanetary disk, the amount of uh, refractory material, the, the heavier elements, is only going to get up to a certain level, maybe 10 or 15 Earth masses. I would be very surprised if you could make a rocky planet more than 10 or 15 Earth masses, partly because there isn't much more rocky material in the disk, and also because of the issue you raised, that if you have that much rocky material, once it forms a core, there's probably still going to be some ices around that will uh, uh, you know, gravitationally accumulate. So roughly speaking, 10 Earth masses is the number I carry in my head, but it's not based on 
very firm theory at this stage. Okay, if we have any further questions on the uh, net, this would be the time to raise your hands on WebEx. And I'll just look around Ames. And we have no further questions here, in which case, let's thank Jeff again. Please, everybody, look for the announcement, which will come out in a little while, about uh, the seminar speakers for next year. And we'll pick up the seminar series in uh, the last week in January or the first week in February. And the seminar will take the holidays off. See you all next year. You, Debbie, did you have a question? <laughs> well, I did, actually. Uh, a second question was, uh, Jeff, when you looked at the... Um, the mass distribution, uh, uh, N of M. What, uh, how carefully did you uh, look at the observational, uh, or sorry, the selection effects on how that affects that slope? Right, you had a slope of M to the minus 1.1. Uh, yeah, clearly, I, the fact that you can't get the smallest mass right. planets affects that slope. Exactly right, and that's just what I was going to say. That um, uh, power law has several flaws with it. One is it doesn't really fit the data, so the power law is not the right description. Uh, uh, Andrew Cumming has done a better analysis and shows that a broken power, two power laws fits better, suggesting that it's, it's steeper on the rocky planet side. But as you point out, there's great incompleteness for low masses. Below a Saturn mass, we struggle to detect those planets unless they're very close in. So the likelihood is that the power law is even steeper on the low mass end with much more, many more low mass planets uh, relative to the higher mass planets than we've detected. So the M to the minus one power law is a simplistic empirical power law and probably a lower limit to the true slope. Thanks. Has that Cummins been work been published? No, uh, he's just finishing it. It's in referee right now. So if you email Andrew Cumming, I'm sure he'll send it to you. Thank you.